Passion Harvest. <laughs> Hello, passionate listeners and watchers. Welcome to Passion Harvest. I am Louisa, your host, International Passion Ambassador. Thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be a really exciting episode. My, our guest today is Dr. Terry Daniel. Dr. Terry Daniel is an acclaimed expert on the process of dying and grieving and its heartfelt depiction of consciousness beyond the physical body. Terry is a clinical chaplain, certified trauma professional, and end-of-life educator, certified in death, dying, and bereavement by the Association of Death Education and Counselling. The focus of Terry's work is to assist dying and grieving individuals to discover a more spiritually spacious understanding of death and beyond. Terry conducts workshops throughout the U.S. to help the dying and the bereaved find healing through meditative, ceremonial, and therapeutic processes that focus on inner transformation rather than external events. Terry has a BA in religious studies, an MA in pastoral care, and a DMIN, I hope I pronounced that properly, (laughs) in pastoral care and counselling from the San Francisco Theological Seminary. She is the author of three books on death and the afterlife and is also the founder and president of the annual Afterlife Awareness Conference. This is her story and this is her passion. Dr. Terry Daniel, thank you and welcome to Passion Harvest. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. It's good to be here. Uh, Finally, we've got together and I'm so excited you're on the show. I'd love to dive into so many topics to discuss. We were just saying this could be a five hour, (laughs) five day, five day talk. Five days, yeah. (laughs) what I would love to ask you about first is why individuals experience uh, have different NDE experience based on their, is it based on their religious or, religious or spiritual beliefs or their socioeconomic status? Why is that? All of the above. It's, okay. So um, I answered the question. <laughs> you just answered your own question. Next question. No. Um, uh, well, you know, what we know since we've been collecting reports of near-death experiences in an academic sense is what we're finding is that they're absolutely culturally influenced. Um, if you go back into human history, of course, people have been having these experiences since the beginning of time. Of course, they weren't written down or recorded, and we've only really started doing that since the 70s. And so there are some researchers like Gregory Shushin and Mark Mirabello who are actually working on collecting these experiences from other cultures and what they're finding, and there there are other researchers doing it as well, is that if you are a Hindu living in India and you have a near-death experience, you are most likely going to see Krishna and Shiva and all the imagery of Hindu theology in your near-death experience. You're probably not going to see Jesus and a heaven with, you know, streets of gold and pearly gates. If you're a Christian in America you're, and you were raised with a lot of that indoctrination, you're going to see Jesus and St. Peter and mansions and whatever's in that story. And so uh, we know this because the research is beginning to come out from these different cultures. The problem has been that up until very recently, all the research that's been done on NDEs has been done in the West, in England, Australia, the Netherlands, and America. So we're still getting it from a Judeo-Christian cultural perspective. Only recently are we starting to get research from Africa and India, Indonesia, and South America and places like that. So what we do know is that they are culturally influenced. So the question is, is that what the real afterlife is like? In the Hindu afterlife, Are they dancing with Shiva and in the Jewish afterlife? Are they with Moses and in the Christian afterlife? Are they with Jesus? Well, the answer is, we don't know. There's no way to know that. What we know is only what we see when we first cross the threshold, right? Because with NDEs, we come right back. So we're only there for a few minutes. And during those first few minutes, during that first introductory phase into the afterlife, we are carrying with us all our stuff that we've accumulated in this incarnation and perhaps others. And then, you know, what we're seeing is 
because our consciousness is still very connected and very attached to where we just came from. So we're bringing with us Jesus and Krishna and Disney characters and grandma and everybody, you know, that we expect to see in the afterlife. Um, and then, you know, five minutes later, we're resuscitated and we come back. So we don't know what happens after that. Yes. So in some way, it's a projection of our consciousness. Exactly. Exactly. It's a projection. And the Buddhists know this because they have uh, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is, uh, uh, I just had a conversation with Robert Thurman about this the other day. It's actually called, uh, I don't have it right, but like the guide to the world between incarnations, blah, blah, blah. It's not really called the mm-hmm. Tibetan Book of the Dead, but they have this whole thing where they say, okay, now you're out of your body. The Buddhist priest sits with the dead person and guides the soul through what they are seeing. And what, according to that tradition, what they are seeing is, uh, here's a bunch of monsters and demons and they're screaming at you and eating your face. And those are just projections of your fears and your traumas and your stuff that you're carrying forward. Over here, if you look over there to the left, there's like bright light and flowers and beautiful stuff. You know, make a choice right now what you want to believe. Do you want to believe that the demons and that stuff is real or do you want to go to the light and the flowers? It's, it's, they actually have a little map that they guide you through the 49 days of Bardo. That's so interesting. And um, it probably takes me into my next question I was going to ask you. Why do people have positive or negative NDE experiences? Well, that's why. And so you'll hear a lot of people, you know, a lot of accounts of hellish. Horrific you know, experiences. Yes. Where they go to hell, where they have like actually have the devil and the flames mm-hmm. and the river of fire, because that's what they've been taught all their life. You know, if you die when you're 80 years old and your entire life you've been indoctrinated into hellfire theology uh, and you feel guilty and and you have self, you know, Christian self-loathing that you're a sinner and you're unworthy and all of this and you're going to go to hell then yeah that's what you're going to see when you first step into that threshold so melvin morse's work in the 1970s with children his book was called uh, closer to the light he was a pediatrician who resuscitated lots of little kids really little like between three and seven and they would report these experiences where if they had religious indoctrination, they would say, oh, I went to see Jesus and I sat on his lap, which is what that famous mm-hmm. kid, uh, Colin Burpo, I think is his name. He had like a book and a movie made out of it, you know. Um, but some of the kids who didn't have religious indoctrination saw Disney characters or they saw their dead grandma or their dead dog. So his research is really important. And that book is old it's been around a long time but it's called closer to the light and it really substantiates a lot of this and through all the cultures and all the religions and all the beliefs is there a commonality with all the near-death experiences in your research yes and no Uh, so what the the most current research i know of that came from india showed that the non-Western cultures, and I could give you a, a link for this if someone wants to see it, had more religious figures in Africa, India, Indonesia, um, Japan, China. They tended to report religious figures more than in the Western countries, which I thought was really surprising. You, um, there, there are no predictable commonalities except maybe an awareness of being out of the body, but in terms of doctrine and theology and culture, there really isn't any. So one of the, um, I actually have this written down here. Let me see if I can find this. Um, sure. there's, there's something called classic NDEs and the classic NDE is you, you see a light and you're drawn to the light and the loved ones are there and the angels and the spirit guides. That's called a classic uh, NDE. But again, that's all comes from Western culture. So we don't really know what comes from other cultures. And we can't just use that as a model because it's, it's not a model. Um, 
the majority of research is based on that model. So that's why they call it the classic NDE, but there's many, many more. And if you look at religious history and scriptures and, you know, narratives and uh, legacies, you know, from every culture in the world, you've got millions of different kinds of NDEs. So just as an example, Mark Mirabello in his work talks about, I'll give you a bunch of examples here. Uh-huh. Like uh, in the Zulu tribes in Africa, they believe that you can be reincarnated as an animal, but only the chief can be reincarnated as a lion. Okay. So where did they get that idea? You know, it had to come from somewhere, right? Of course. So somebody in the tribe, or maybe many people died, and everyone thought they were dead. And then somehow maybe the shaman resuscitated them, or they did CPR or whatever, and the guy comes back and he goes, I went to the other world and I saw all my relatives and they were cats and dogs and monkeys, but I saw the chief and he was a lion. And that goes into the cultural story. Um, in uh, Winnebago shaman uh, went to the spirit land and lived with an old couple until he w- entered a womb and was born again as a baby. So maybe that belief system says, you know, you go back to this old couple who become your parents. I mean, there's a long list of them. Um, uh, in, a, in the Peruvian shamanic tradition, um, there's an afterlife with three dominant worlds, the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the stone kingdom. So there's just so many. So where do these come from? And I think it comes from people in these cultures throughout history who've had these experiences, who report them within the context of their cultural framework. Hmm. I've got two questions that have automatically come to mind. I don't know which one to ask you first. I guess I'm going to ask you, why did you originally, why are you so interested in this subject? (laughs) I I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. Um, Well, you know, I'm surrounded by it all the time because of the Afterlife Conference. And, you know, I started the Afterlife Conference 11 years ago. And we have all the speakers that you've interviewed on your show, you know, Raymond Moody, Eben Alexander, and Anita Morjani, all of them. Um, And they're all very, you know, they all have their story about near-death experience. But I am a researcher and I want to know more. And that kind of goes back to my story So um, after my son died 14 years ago, I started to receive communications from him and I was blown away by that. And my first and second book was kind of based on that. But And I was starting to conduct groups and teach people about, here's what I know about the afterlife based on what I have channeled. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that that was colored by my own experience. And I didn't want to teach that to people as the absolute truth because I don't know the absolute truth. And I was also starting my work in hospice at the time. And I was a hospice volunteer and I was sitting with a lot of dying people who were having their own out of body experiences. And I wanted to talk with them about that and work with them about that. But I, as a hospice volunteer, you're not really allowed to go that deeply with the patients unless you are a chaplain. So I decided to become a chaplain. And from there, I went and got a bachelor's degree in religious studies and a master's degree in pastoral counseling and a doctorate in in pastoral counseling so that I could study all these other religious views. I didn't want to just take my own word for it. Though back in the beginning, I used to say, hey, whatever you channel, whatever you feel is true is true. And it is, it is. But if you're going to be out in the world teaching and counseling people, you need to have a more multifaceted perspective. And that's why I got interested in this. So can I ask, in your opinion, what what happens in the afterlife? (laughs) (laughs) What happens in my afterlife? Exactly. What's right for you might be completely different. You know, I know what I would like to think will happen in my afterlife. You know, I've done a lot of training in shamanism and, you know, where we do an enactment of our deathbed and we bring in the people on the other side who we want to be there to guide us. So I have a whole story of what I want mine to be, but I can't tell anybody that's what theirs is going to be. 
But 10 years ago, I did try to tell people that. And now you don't anymore. Well, now I, I say, yes, there's an afterlife. Yes, you will be met by all kinds of friends and guides and ancestors and beings. Um, this is what I know and what I believe to be true. Um, you will have to deal with whatever stuff your soul is carrying from one incarnation to another. So I guess I do tell people what to expect in the afterlife. You know, um, I had a conversation on Facebook with a young guy the other day who said, when you die, everything is erased. And when you come back to your next incarnation, you come back completely clean with nothing. And I said, that's ridiculous. <laughs> because what would be the point of reincarnation if you didn't accumulate wisdom and experience? So I intuitively know that you do accumulate wisdom and experience. So I know that, you know, I believe that um, in the afterlife, you review your past incarnations, you review your relationships, you make a plan for what you're going to do next. This is what seems like the truth to me. Well, thank you for sharing that. And in, obviously, it's your opinion and all your research. Why do we reincarnate and why do we keep coming back into phys physical form? Well, the way I understand it, as it has been downloaded to me, through channeling, because you can't really find an answer for that. I mean, you know, Buddhism will give you some answers and you might find some stuff, but this is what I think. I think that our essence, our soul, whatever you want to call it, chooses physicality specifically because it wants to accumulate experience. So, so there's a wonderful talk of, you know, Esther Hicks channeling Abraham that says, in the beginning, there was just this Blah, stream of consciousness, just uh, just endless universal energy. And at some point, some aspect of that energy said, I'm not getting enough of a perspective here in this soup. I'm going to pull out of the soup and take a different form so that I can look at the soup from a different perspective. Does that make sense? It's like you can't read a piece of paper in, when it's right up to your face like this. You have to put it over here, right? So this aspect of consciousness separated from the oneness into physical form so that I could look at the oneness from a distance. And you find this in the ancient Christian texts too. So oneness became two-ness. And I think that that aspect of collective consciousness that had that desire to pull out and experience this earth realm is the reason why we incarnate. So, so our eternal essence that incarnates over and over again um, just wants to accumulate, accumulate, accumulate um, like a perpetual motion machine. Why? Why do we need to do that? Why can't we just check out and disappear and float into the void? I think it's because all this accumulated experience goes into a collective wisdom source like, like the Akashic Record or something like that. Like a wisdom bank. A, wins a wisdom bank, exactly. The Scientologists even call it a bank. Oh, really? I mean, it's everywhere. It's in every religious tradition, some form of this. Well, that's a great way to explain it. Thank you. I'd love to hear more about your work with the dying and the grieving. And I know there's a couple of topics that you particularly wanted to talk to the audience about. I can, it's fine. I can talk about anything. Um, <laughs> there is nothing as um, mystical and powerful than being with a person when they die. If you've ever watched a baby be born, not your own necessarily, but been with someone else when they're having a baby, it's just like that. But without the screaming, <laughs> usually. Right. Um, uh, so after my son died, so when my son died, this is uh, discussed in my first book, A Swan in Heaven. Um, he started communicating with me 30 minutes after he died. And this, this still continues all these years later. But from the experience, aside from the grief of being a mother losing a child of and all of that, with that set aside for the moment, um, I'd never seen a person die before. And 
watching the process of him over time, he was very sick for a long time, gradually separating the soul from the body fascinated me. I could see that happening. And during the actual process of what we call active dying, where that separation is really starting to happen and the person is no longer in their body, um, I could feel where he was going. And it was the most beautiful thing I ever saw because it was a, a soul going back to source. And I knew after that that I wanted to experience that again and again and again and again. So I became a hospice volunteer and was, spent a lot of time around dying people and had amazing experiences. And as I said before, because I wanted to discuss the spiritual experiences of the dying people, I had to go and get deeper training so that I could mm -hmm. become a hospice chaplain. But um, I'll tell you a story. Um, I had a woman in a hospice and I visited her and I have this guided meditation that I do a lot, which I could even do on your show if you want. Sure. Um, and in this guided meditation, I, I show that I take the person to look at a starry sky of millions of stars. And then I have them breathe in the stars and it becomes starlight and they're breathing in this light. I'm giving you the real short version of it right now. And I did it with this lady who was dying. Um, breathing in the stars, breathing in the stars, breathing out fear, breathing in light. And a couple of days later, I went back to see her and she said, I had a dream that an angel came to visit me and she gave me some pills. She put pills on my tongue, but instead of little round pills, they were stars. Oh, that's lovely. So that's how she remembered that experience. And that's the kind of stuff that happens with the dying. I mean, I take my hat off to you. I don't know if I could do that work. And, and, and in our culture, people tend to shy away from the ones that are dying. Totally. In, in all of Western culture. you know, this It's almost as if we're afraid it's catchable or... It is catchable. <laughs> right? I mean, sometimes... But, well, we're yeah. all going to die at some stage, but... Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a, a death-averse culture. And that has to do with religion. You know, because of the Judeo-Christian uh, theology about, you know, um, an angry God and punishment. And then we, you know, then when the church formed in the, you know, the first few hundred years after Jesus, then we got all that doctrine and catechism about hell and punishment. That's why we're afraid of death. And also because, also because of the theology, we're not encouraged to do inner exploration of our own spiritual nature, meditation, dream work, uh, out-of-body journeying, uh, mediumship, all of that is a no-no. Mm. So all we have is this doctrine of, oh my God, death is so scary because we might go to hell. The other part of that uh, also comes from, you know, the plagues, in Europe, because death was really ugly and painful and awful. So we have the physical fear of death, but the church didn't help much with that. I mean, we do get attached to our physical body. No one necessarily wants to die. Generally, can the pain, because I think many people aren't necessarily afraid of dying. They're afraid of the pain that their physical body experiences. Generally, can the pain be alleviated with medication? Oh, absolutely. But it depends how you die. If you get, you know, shot, sure. you know, you're going to have pain. Um, if you have a natural death of sickness and you have hospice care, you will not have pain. You know, if it's treated, yes, pain can be alleviated with medication. That's what palliative care is. And palliative care is relatively new in our society. But if you have fourth stage cancer and you are dying, and there's no more intervention you can do, and you put yourself in hospice care, they will address the pain, um, and you will die pretty much pain-free with spiritual care, with counseling for your family, with all these wonderful things. Or you can do what a lot of people do, like, um, who is it now? Is it Prince Philip in England who just got diagnosed with 
Oh, I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, I think it's Queen Elizabeth's husband. He's 95 and he's having aggressive cancer treatment. So you can do that. Um, But that's misery and pain. You don't want to have chemo and when you're 95, unless you're terrified of death. And what would you say to those people that maybe are experiencing or have received, received some sort of diagnosis and are terrified or of dying? It, I, there's not a general answer to okay. that. You know, I mean, it would depend on the person, you know, it, that it totally case by case. It, sure. it depends on how much theology is involved or what they're afraid of. There is something that we call a spiritual care assessment, which is like, okay, what's unfinished in your life? Do you have forgiveness issues? Did you have meaning in your life? Is there something missing that you feel like is incomplete? Are there relationships that need healing? Those are usually the things that cause the fear in people. So if somebody said to me, I just found out I have three months to live and I'm really afraid, that's what I would look for with them. That's what I would want to talk about. Tell me about your life. What feels unfinished? What feels meaningless? What can we heal so that you will feel comfortable in leaving everything from a, in a peaceful place? And thank you. And maybe you can't generalize on this either. And it's again, is case by case, but what are the common regrets that people have that they need to work through before they die? You know, there, there are pretty common ones. Um, I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about my own regrets. And my biggest regret is that I, there were so many things I could have done different in my son's life when he was sick. And, you know, ways that I could have made his life happier and better. Every mother feels this. Mm-hmm. So that's like universal. I regret that I didn't travel enough. And for me, that's about it, you know, and there are things in my life that are missing. Like, you know, after my, he was my only child, I never really got to have a lot of motherhood and family time. I miss that, but I don't regret not having it. It was just something that I would have liked to have in life. And it just didn't work out that way. Um, The real deep regrets are generally things like, you know, relationships that ended badly where forgiveness and reconciliation is needed and they didn't have a chance to do that. And sometimes we can help them do that. A lot of uh, people have family members that they're estranged from. And, you know, the, you know, it's like, do you want me to call your son and bring him here so you can make peace with him? And sometimes they'll say no. And sometimes they'll say yes. So I I think the regrets are, you know, anything that you could think of right now that you would regret is probably pretty true for most people. Right. Oh, no, now I'm just thinking about it. It's a good thing to think about. It is. Yeah. And and to fix it now. Right. Because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Exactly. This is not a personal interview, but are you going to be booking some more travel expeditions in the in the future? I hope so. Well, I travel, you know, I, I mean, before COVID, I traveled a lot, but only really just in the US. I've never mm-hmm. been anywhere. I was, I've always been really poor. I've never had any money. And I could never afford to go anywhere. You know, I mean, I, I travel, like I said, I travel now because I do speaking engagements and workshops around the country. And the only reason I can do that is because it pays for itself. Sure. But most people I know have been to India and Israel and Europe and South America. I don't know how they do it. I never had the money to do that. I've always been very, a dear friend of mine said to me the other day, Terry, you took a vow of poverty. And apparently I did. So that, you know, that's something I'm sad about, you know, for, for who I am and what I do. I should have traveled more. You do remarkable, remarkable work. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm so interested in this multicultural stuff, because I never actually got to go there. But and, you may, you may. Uh, well, I'm 68. <laughs> I'm getting You're little, young. I am young and I am old. You know? So who knows? Maybe the next thing that'll happen is I'll get to spend a year traveling around the world, visiting all these cultures. But I've studied them in different ways. From, from my desk. 
And, you know, I've been, I mean, I, you know, I did the four winds foundation shamanism training and I did Sibon Fu, Somme's training in African ritual. So I've done all that, but I didn't ever go to Africa or South America or any of these places. Well, I'm excited for you. (laughs) you. (laughs) And anyone who's listening, if you want to make a donation to send me on a trip around the world. (laughs) Yes. Your details will be in the show notes. (laughs) Um, just moving on, what, you know, obviously there's the person that's dying, but all their family and the grieving, how, and again, it's going to be a case by case basis, but that must be confronting as well for the ones that are left behind, the loved ones. Again, it depends on their cultural and spiritual references. Mm-hmm. So you could have a family who is very evangelical Christian and they have their loved one in the hospital and they're praying and praying and they've got the church group praying and the phone tree and the prayer registry and all the, everyone's praying, praying, praying for the guy to get better and he doesn't. And so those people are going to be very freaked out that their belief system didn't hold up and they're going to go through a spiritual crisis. They're going to be angry at God Or most likely what usually happens is they blame themselves. Our faith wasn't strong enough. We prayed and prayed, but we obviously didn't believe and trust God enough or he, God would have saved him, which is an absolutely ridiculously stupid theology. I will come right out and say that. And it does so much damage to people. Um, What could happen with someone like that is they can say, well, that didn't work the way I thought it would. Maybe I should rethink my theology. Maybe my understanding of prayer and God isn't what I've been told since I was five years old. And that would be a healthy response. But I very frequently see the unhealthy response where the one thing they'll do is they'll get angry at the medical establishment. Um, I heard of a patient the other day who just ranted and raved about hospice was so terrible and they killed her mother. Mm. And, you know, they'll just project it, project it because... The theology is a sacred cow. You can't question that, right? Um, So that's one thing that happens with grief. Um, So the religious beliefs can sometimes, or the way they're perceived, aren't always helpful. No, they're not. In fact, that's the title of my newest book, Grief and God, When Religion Does More Harm Than Healing. Now, religious beliefs can be helpful, too. There's, there's something called the Religious Coping Scale by a researcher named Kenneth Pargament, which is really good stuff. Um, and he has these categories of positive and negative religious coping. So positive religious coping would be like you see this thing called God as a co-creator, as a partner, and you, you ask God to give you strength. God, help me cope with this. Help me accept whatever happens. Help me accept the outcome and walk through it with grace and wisdom and understanding. That's healthy religious coping. Unhealthy religious coping is, God, please don't let him die. I was a good Christian. I believed in you. You can't abandon me now. That's unhealthy religious coping. And there are all these, you know, things in between. I'm sorry I interrupted you before you were talking about oh, that's fine. religion and the person that uh, directed their anger towards the medical establishment because they felt that that was the only option to release their emotional sensitivity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that does happen. You know, I've seen, I've seen people sue the hospital, you know, because really, because I mean, sometimes they, I, I won't them. laugh, but yeah. Yeah, sometimes they they should sue the hospital, but I've seen them do it for just, you know, ridiculous things. Because because they're hurting. Yeah, because they're hurting. And they just didn't have the tools to cope with the reality of the loss. Um, Grief, oh my gosh, it's such a big thing. And again, I know this is so individual for each person, but grief can last years or potentially someone's whole life if someone is experiencing severe grief and is working through it or just realize they can't get through it, what's your advice? Well, I'm really glad you said that because that was the next thing I was going to say. Oh. Like The next thing to know about grief <laughs> is something that we call complicated grief. And it doesn't mean complicated the way we use that word in pop culture, like 
it's complicated. You know, it's not that. It doesn't mean that there's like multiple aspects and it's a complicated thing. Uh, what it means is that, so there is an expected normal trajectory of healing from a loss. Even a horrible loss, like your little child is run over by a truck, like the worst horrible thing in the world. Over time, you are expected to process and move gradually toward healing. Sometimes that doesn't happen. And it's the way I teach it a lot with my students is it's like if you break your leg and the cast isn't set right or you get an infection and you've heard the doctor say, well, the surgery was a success, but there were complications. It's that kind of complications. Something interrupts or diverts the healing process so that it doesn't follow a healthy movement of healing. And many, many things can contribute to that. But you will see people who had a very normal loss, like their mother, their 85-year-old mother died. And three years later, they're still crying every day and angry and dysfunctional and depressed because they were not able to cope with the death of their mother, which is a very easy death to cope with. 85-year-old people are supposed to die. So why does that person have so much trouble with it? It could be a million things. It could be religious belief. We prayed and we should have saved her. It could be the relationship all their life was a troubled one. It could be guilt. Uh, it could be, you know, the circumstances of the death, perhaps if it was like violent or traumatic, there's, there's complicated grief is a whole other discussion. Um, but that's what happens when you see people. I have seen people 25 years after having a stillbirth, a baby born dead, that still are obsessed with that loss. And I think this is almost epidemic in a lot of ways in the grief world. And the reason for this is because there are so many people out there on social media and calling themselves grief guides and grief support groups that are not run by people who have any actual training in grief counseling or grief theory, and they perpetrate really bad ideas. And there is one group in particular, I talk about this all the time, I talk about it in my books, which is a group for bereaved parents, very well known. And they, the people in that group are coming back there for 20, 20 years. And the reason they do is because the chapter leaders are, have, are not required to be counselors or have any training in group facilitation or counseling. Um, the administration of the organization, nobody on that board has any academic degree. It's all peer to peer. And when it's peer to peer, what you get is commiseration and, and the support, the peer support's wonderful, but they don't have tools. They don't know how to tell you how to process trauma and pain. They don't have those tools. And so people just keep repeating, you know, and so you go to these meetings and every month somebody's new comes in, they tell their story, all the other people tell their story again. All they do is tell their story over and over and over again for years and they become stuck in their story and it's, it's not a healing thing. And they, they perpetrate ideas like this particular group says, you will never get over the loss of a child. Uh, yes, get over, first of all, is a word we would never use. They say things like holidays and my birthdays and milestones will always be sad for you. No, they won't. They won't always be sad. They can be beautiful and warm and tender and happy. And so there's all these like ideas that they put forth about you're going to just be a mess forever. No one, oh, another thing they say, no one will ever understand you except other parents who've lost a child. And that's true that no one will understand what it's like to lose a child, but that doesn't mean that you have to be socially isolated from other people or other grievers. So there's all this stuff contributes to complicated grief. Interesting. I've got a final question. 
Mm-hmm. I believe it must have been comforting for you to be able to, despite the um, grief, to connect with your son. For those who have lost loved ones, what's your advice to potentially connect with them? Um, I have a document that I can send you that you can maybe put in the show notes sure. um, called 10 Tips for Talking to Heaven. And it's exactly that. Oh, it's great. Like, I'll do that. Yeah, that, that would be a really helpful thing. Um, there are, you can definitely do it. They, uh, your loved ones are right here. They're right here. And I, I feel like they're around us all the time. They're busy doing their thing. But because there's no linear time space in other dimensions, you can feel them, you can call upon them. And a lot of people don't recognize communications when they get them. Like I've had a lot of people say, oh, you know, my husband's favorite bird was a cardinal. But I, and, and, and a cardinal comes to my window every day, but I never get any signs from my husband. It's right. like, they, they come in symbols. People will say, oh, I never get any signs, but I have dreams all the time that my husband is waving at me, you know, but they don't understand that that's a communication because they're expecting what they've seen in movies, like flying tables and lights flashing and ghosts. And it isn't like that. It's much subtler. It's a feeling you, you feel it inside and you can train yourself to accept that that feeling is real. No, I'd love if you shared that. And for everyone that's sure. listening or watching, I'll put it in the show notes. Okay, um, great. Hello, Dr. Terry Daniel, I've asked all the questions. Is there something potentially if you'd like to do the meditation or if you'd like to share something with the Passion Harvest audience that I haven't asked you, please go ahead. Um, you know that I have that meditation recorded with music and it's really beautiful. And I think rather than doing it live sure. right now, you could put that in, there's a link to it. You could Is put that, that on your website? I no, it's not. I would have to send you a like a Google Drive link. Okay, I'll put that I, in the I show notes as well. <laughs> yeah, let's put it in the show yeah. notes. And you know what? I probably sh- I only recorded it just a couple weeks ago, so I never thought to put it on my website. But let's do it that way, and then that way people can click on it and do the meditation when they that'd be you know, great. Are well, in the right space. A for wealth it. of a wealth bank in these show notes. <laughs> yeah to put stuff there so, so and then, and all your details will be in the show notes for people to connect directly with you okay so if there's sending, anything else as well you'd like to express please do okay so i'm um say, i'm gonna send you this stardust meditation and the talking to heaven okay good yeah anything else that i've missed that you'd like to talk about oh i'd like to talk about the afterlife conference that would yes probably please be do good. it's fantastic we forgot about that and there'll so be a I, link for that in the show notes as yes, well yes and, and yes <laughs> And that's afterlifeconference.com. And last year we went uh, virtual because we had to cancel the live conference because of COVID. So we're going to be virtual this year again as well in 2021. Uh, And really all I can say about it is I started it 11 years ago. I've had all the speakers of every book you've ever read on the topic of near-death experience and afterlife and uh, mediums and channeling and multicultural out of body experiences. So we, we have kind of become the, the clearinghouse for all that information right now. And the website is just afterlifeconference.com. And this year it's going to be virtual June 24th through 27th. So you can wa- come online and do the whole thing live with us. It will also be recorded and you'll have access to the recording for six months Wonderful. Uh, afterwards so come to the afterlife conference you yes. will love it <laughs> well dr terry daniel thank you so much for being on passion harvest i've really appreciated all that you've offered to us thank you it's and for being thank such you. a light worker in the world oh thank you same to you my what friend am- i'm oh, so glad well. to meet you finally it was very nice thank you so thank much you. bye thank terry you. bye If you like this episode, please do subscribe for weekly passionate inspirational interviews.